much. Anyway, um, so uh, the topic of this talk is to use signatures for optimal stopping problems. And I also want to uh, uh, give you an introduction in uh, the topic of signatures itself, and also in, in, in particular in the context of machine learning. So, oops, right. Okay, um, as a kind of introduction, um, what are we trying to do in this talk? Uh, we are given a process Y, a reward process, let's say, and we're trying to solve the associated optimal stopping problem. So you want to compute the sum of all stopping times of the expected value of the stop process Y at time tau. And I would like to say that, I mean, first of all, this is an important problem, which has lots of, lots of applications, in particular in finance, but also beyond finance. I mean, it is somewhat, uh, one of the prototypical optimal control problems, I guess. Um, and correspondingly, there is a, multiple, a multitude of methods to analyze and also numerically approximate the solution of the optimal stopping problem. However, most of them are built on uh, uh, Markov processes. That is, they suppose that Y itself, or maybe is a Markov process, or maybe, there is a, a Markov process X behind Y, so that, for instance, Y is a function of X. And these include uh, the hammond jacobi bellman PDEs, which is kind of dynamical problem in continuous time, but there are also uh, simulation-based methods, least squares Monte Carlo, typically based on a time discrete problem. And by the way, I formulate this problem as a time as a continuous time problem, but you should always think that uh, there is also an associated uh, discrete time problem, which sometimes could occur as a as a approximation of the continuous time problem. But in many other respects, it's also the opposite way. So maybe there is a rather a high dimensional discrete time problem, and you use a continuous time problem as an approximation of that. So both of them are, are uh, things that are seen in, in practice. And there are also various methods which are essentially based on a direct parameterization of, of the policy or of the stopping region or something like that. And generally speaking, most of these methods really break down when you do not have a Markov process. I mean, Think of the HGB equation, for instance. This HGB equation becomes now a path-dependent PDE. So in other words, it becomes a PDE where the space variable, if you like, is a function, is an infinite dimensional object. And this can be formulated. And in fact, uh, uh, I gave a talk in the seminar uh, one or two years ago about the uh, in that case, even slightly more complicated, the BSPD, a backward stochastic partial differential equation uh, approach uh, to such a path dependent optimal control problem. But at least when you go to numerics, it's obvious that this becomes very tricky and also for the theory. Similar regression methods, because now again, the state variable becomes infinite dimensional. And um, what a, yeah, and in this case, we use a parametrization method, which is based on a finite dimensional approximation of such an infinite dimensional variable, which is actually the signature. And I should maybe highlight that to my knowledge, there is basically, I, I know basically only one uh, theoretical framework where this kind of non-Markovian infinite dimensional stochastic optimal control problem have been analyzed theoretically in a rigorous way. And this is based on wiener Kaas uh, approaches because the wiener Kaas uh, approach is basically the only uh, kind of a gen generic approach which does not use the structure of a Markov process. So maybe uh, I will very quickly go through 
one of the uh, standard methods for the Markovian case, and I picked the least squares of Monte Carlo, which to the best of my knowledge, at least in the finance part, is really the most often used method for solving this kind of problems. So we call, we define a value function, which is here basically the solution of the optimal, optimal stopping problem, but started at time t rather than at time zero. And we assume that we have a, a Markovian situation. Okay, we assume that there's a Markov process X such that the reward process, the cash flow process, is given as a function of the of this Markov process. And in that case, and I am really uh, doing this on a very intuitive level, the dynamic programming principle basically says, well, at time t. I compare two values. I compare the value that I get if I stop right now, which is G, and I compare the continuation value, which is the uh, conditional expectation of the future value function given the present value of the state variable X. And I pick the one which is larger. So from a numerical, but also from a, from a theoretical point of view, the uh, relevant or the, 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 the difficult part in this uh, formula is the red part, meaning the conditional expectation. And uh, how do you solve? I mean, least squares Monte Carlo basically says, let's uh, uh, compute this conditional expectation by some Monte Carlo regression based on uh, simulated samples of the underlying process X and some basis functions A. And of course, you can see uh, how cursive dimensionality enters here because, for instance, if you really use this kind of, if you like, naive basis function polynomials of degree less or equal n, which is something that many people are using, then of course, this goes very, very quickly in the dimension of the underlying state space rd uh, christian i'm sorry alexander here can i interrupt you sure sure just go ahead understanding you know it's not directly my topic and uh, just to understand better i usually used to see equation which we solve on the slide number one somehow and then either we solve forward problem or backward problem and uh, you mean this equation or which equation yeah, but I do not see here equation. I mean, I do not see PDE, ODE, whatever. Oh, okay. And so somehow you see we are on the slide four, but I still do not know which equation we solve. Uh, we are solving the equation for V, which is this dynamic problem. So, okay. So we have here a, 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 a stochastic process X. Think of it as the solution of an SDE, but it could also be, it could be something like a geometric Brownian motion, okay? So assume that you know X. Mm -hmm. And V, the formula for the dynamic programming principle here. So if you, okay. So there are two situations. This is an exact equality. If you consider the optimal stopping time in discrete, uh, optimal stopping problem in discrete time. If you actually consider the optimal stopping problem in continuous time, this is an approximation. And the true equation that V solves is an Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, is a PDE, mm -hmm. a nonlinear PDE, in fact. So uh, it depends a little bit on the point of view. So either we are solving a problem in uh, uh, discrete time, in which case, uh, the dynamic programming principle that is written down here is actually true. I mean, it's, it's correct. Or we're solving it in continuous time. In this case, uh, this is just an approximation. It's a time discretization, if you like. Okay, thank you. And second question, do we solve just one forward problem or we solve multiple because it's, let's say, multi-parametric problem? Um, in this case, let's say we're solving one. Okay, just one. I just tried to understand where is numerical difficulty here. Just to solve one stochastic forward problem. Yes. 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 Okay. And problem. Well, it's mm -hmm. you know it's a forward problem, but it's also a backward problem because the the manic programming, as you see here, it works backward in time. So first, I have to compute the value function 
So the iteration for the value function is backward in time. But of course, the process X is kind of solved forward in time. Okay, thank you. But yes, the, the tricky part is uh, uh, indeed solving this, computing this conditional expectation because you see now, I mean, thank you, Alexander, for this remark, because uh, if you look at this dynamic uh, programming uh, principle, I solve this conditional expectation for one particular lowercase x. But if you look at the right hand side, I will need later plug in many different values for the x. So I really need a functional approximation. So Christian, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I just, I'm using Alex's interruption as, as uh, my in. Um, in, in this uh, um, uh, Monte Carlo optimization, it seems that you're also sampling the initial state XTI rather than fixing it. Um, Is that right? Yes, 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 yes. Because so, so, I, I mean, if T is zero and I'm really at the initial time, then I'm probably not going to do this anymore. I'm just computing an expectation. But yeah. if T is positive, then yes, indeed. I mean, my process X starts at time zero in a point mass. And then for every positive T, I already have a distribution. But presumably you, you want a, um, for the conditional expectation, you want a function of small x. So, um, do, do you um, get, do away with that and just sample? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a simplification. Of course, this, this coefficient C phi, they will depend on T. Okay. So and basically, for every time step, you will get new coefficient C phi. You could, bit, in principle, say I do a regression jointly in T and X, but you know the dynamic programming principle probably makes that a little bit tricky. Okay. I mean, it's actually. I mean, this is also a good question because you see many kind of machine learning uh, approaches to this, which basically solve a one big optimization problem, basically learning the full value function as a function of t and x at one in one optimization problem. I think that the clever thing about the dynamic, dynamic programming principle is it allows you to solve many kind of smaller problems. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, instead of solving one big global optimization problem, you, can, you, you solve a, a sequence of smaller kind of local in time optimization problems. So I think this is actually a feature, not a bug, of this dynamic programming problem, because of course this tends to make the optimization problems simpler. So, so what is V-bar in this case just uh... Last question. What is V bar? Uh, okay, V bar. I'm I'm using V bar because of course uh, the 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 V here is not going to be the exact value function. It's going to be ah, okay. function. So yeah, also a good question. <laughs> um, okay, so I mentioned already that many people use neural networks or machine learning techniques to solving uh, to 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 mitigate this apparent curse of dimensionality. There's really a bunch of them. I mean, I'm not going to really, I don't want to mention that. Maybe one interesting one is this uh, uh, work by Kohler et al, because it's uh, it's one of the earliest papers in this, in this literature. And they do a, a very nice analysis. Um, however, I mean, before going to the actual topic of this talk, I actually want to, to make a, an extended remark on this kind of machine, this neural network story. I mean, we have a, a high dimensional pro approximation problem and we learn all the time that people claim that neural, that deep learning uh, beats the curse of dimensionality. I mean, this is something I have heard many times over the last few years. And I think this is, kind of a misunderstanding. That's not what neural networks actually do or what deep learning is doing in many of these cases. 
And to, to make this point, and I know that uh, many people of, of here, I, I make to, to make this point, let's formulate this problem a little bit closer in a way it actually is usually set up. The way it's usually, usually set up is you have uh, some scalar basis functions here denoted by B1 up to BP. So multi-index set lambda, and then we approximate a function V, which would be the V of T comma X in the previous slide as a sum of, a weighted sum of, uh, of uh, products of this scalar basis. I mean, scalar in the sense of basis functions, which takes a scalar variable. And this produces you a huge coefficient tensor. And then as many of you know much better than I do, uh, one way you can do is you can look for low rank tensor formats uh, to kind of compress uh, this huge tensor and thereby avoid the curse of dimensionality. Um, for instance, using tensor trains, but there, as I understand, other uh, uh, versions of, of, of this idea. And we actually did this in a recent paper with Martin Eigel, uh, Leon Saland, and Philip Trunschke, where we just tried using the same approach, using this a tensor train approach, to solve this very high dimensional problem. And for two reasons. First, uh, we want to see if uh, deep learning is really so much better than anything, uh, you know, standard numerical analysis offers for kind of beating the curse of dimensionality. And this, what this table is basically telling you, that's not the case. I mean, the reference value is from Becker, Credito, Jensen. And this is a, by now, I think, quite famous paper on uh, solving uh, optimal stopping problems using uh, deep learning. And you see here is, what you see here is uh, that such a tensor train approach based on, on dynamic programming actually works extremely well. So you get uh, very, very good results, actually get the same quality of results at least when the dimension of the problem is, let's say starting from 10. I mean, in very small dimensions, actually I would need a, a higher degree of polynomials to use. I should explain what the what this reference value wise is an interval. I mean, for this kind of optimal control problem, you can always get a, a lower bound and an upper bound by combining a primal and a dual method. So this is the interval between lower and upper bound. And basically bold faced means that you are within this uh, interval. And interestingly, you see that when the dimension gets larger, you already are in this interval when you only take degree one polynomials, which is kind of amazing, right? And also, I mean, this paper by Becker, Caradito, and Jensen, they became pretty famous because they could solve uh, very, very high dimensional problems that nobody could solve before. And you see, tensor trains allow you to solve uh, exactly the same dimensional, I mean, go to the same dimensions. And of course, well, not of course, but uh, actually the training cost for the tensor train is much smaller. They are much faster to train than these deep neural networks. But maybe more interesting is uh, the second plot, which plots uh, the tensor ranks. And let's look at the, well, it doesn't really matter. Let's look at the blue picture. So this is the, 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 the blue uh, 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 bars here are the average and the black lines are the maximum tensor rank in plotted against the dimension of the problem. And if you see, if the dimension is 20, maximum rank is six. Well, because this is what we provided as, the, as kind of the maximum. And the average rank is also close to six. So it really uses up all those ranks that we, we give it to you. If you go to dimension 1,000, the maximum rank is three and the average rank is one. So, if we compare this to these results here, this basically to me indicates that this optimal stopping problem actually becomes simpler when you increase the dimensions. Christian. Yep. I mean, couldn't this be related with the pro with the way the problem was formulated? I mean, when when they did this uh, this uh, this parametric representation of of the data for the problem, 
Did they create it maybe in such a way that actually, as you increase the dimensions, each of the variables is less important? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, to, to be fair, that's probably the difference between the sorted and the unsorted picture, because this is a max call option. So it's an option on the maximum of the individual assets. And the sorted figure means that before we actually apply our tensor train approach, we sort all, all the variables according to the size. Because if the option is an option on the maximum, then of course you would expect that the largest values are more important than the smallest one. And you see this has a big impact when the dimension is moderate, let's say in 20. 30 up to 100. But when the dimension is 1,000, this doesn't matter anymore, basically. And I think what happens here is you get some kind of, I mean, it's not the law of large numbers, but you get some kind of, uh, uh, of, of yeah, of, of large dimension effect where when the dimension becomes really high, there is some kind of uh, uh, invariance principle getting into the play. Very nice. There's a question by, by Vin. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Can I have a question? Um, sure. So in previous page, um, I see that you have a table with P and that is mean that P equal to one, then you approximate the function at a linear function. Um, I'm not sure if linear or F fine, but yes. Uh, so, so that's that actually um, because linear function have very small number of uh, parameter to identify. So we yes. maybe do not see the effect of uh, curve dimensionality. Well, I mean, you should, I mean, what, what happens here is that you have, well, you have a product of these functions, right? So these are linear functions in, in one dimension and then you take products of these functions. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, indeed, uh, the interesting thing is if you take uh, P equals one um, in dimension 500, you get very accurate results. Yeah, so maybe, maybe uh, I have another comment on that. Maybe because uh, when you have big dimension and the linear function already approximates well, it means that everything is Gaussian. That's, that's kind of what I, what I mean, but there is some invariance principle uh, becoming, getting into effect. I mean, I don't think it's actually Gaussian. It's more like maybe an extreme value distribution that comes into play. Um, but yes, I mean, I mean, my I mean, I don't claim that I understand completely what's going on. Uh, uh, my claim is more like, it seems to me that this is an example where actually um, the high dimensional problems become simpler. So to me, the 10 dimensional problem is much more difficult here than the 500 dimensional problem. I see. I see. Yeah. Thanks. And for me, this is more a comment to this kind of uh, practice that I see sometimes with people from the machine learning community who basically set up a, a problem class and then they show that they can can solve a very very high dimensional uh, uh, kind of representative of this problem, but just being high dimensional doesn't mean that you have solved a difficult problem. That's kind of all I want to say here somehow. Um, anyway. Um, I have spent already half an hour and I'm not even started to begin talking on the topic. Um, me, the, your topic is very interesting. <laughs> you thought that you would bore people? No, quite the opposite. <laughs> Thanks for, the, for, for this remark, bro. Um, okay, so what is the, the signature and why is it interesting? So um, in this first slide, I want to assume that I have a smooth path X, which takes values in RD. And by smooth, what you really need is a continuous path of boundary variation. But you may very well think of a C infinity path. 
And then basically I look at iterated integrals. So I have a, some set of multi, a multi index I want to IN, and then I integrate components of this path X against each other. However, because we are going to identify some algebraic structure behind these multi indices, actually I'm going to call them a word rather than a multi index. So I'm going to look at the word I want up to IN. And I'm going to collect all these iterated integrals into an object, which I call the signature. And that object is, first of all, it's an infinite dimensional object. And it takes values in the kind of tensor algebra D double parenthesis of RD, which is uh, the, the Cartesian product of all the tensor uh, products RD to the power n in this tensor product sense. And for approximation purposes, uh, of course, this infinite object has, will have to be truncated. And for this, I will I also immediately already define the truncated object. Now, you may seem this is, you may, you may say that this is all uh, just to confuse you because we have all this fancy structure, this tensor algebra. Indeed, T of RD is in fact a, a, a tensor algebra. So it's an algebra. Uh, it's an infinite dimensional uh, uh, space and it's actually not very easy to kind of make to, 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 to give a, a, a meaningful topology on this space. So it's somehow think of it as a space of, of formal tensor series. I mean, it is a space of formal tensor series. And what I'm going to trying to convince you in the next few slides is that it's actually makes sense to put the structure in place because we can work with the structure. It allows us to understand the signature much better. So again, T of RD is an algebra and the product that I define here is really just a, a natural uh, uh, extension of the tensor uh, product that is defined on this uh, basically constituent spaces here. Okay, and once you have defined this tensor product, so this is just extended uh, by the distribution. I mean, it's, it's the distribution law of, of, of multiplication, right? Should be noted that this is not the commutative product, but you know, it's not surprising since the tensor product is not commutative. And the first theorem, which really shows you that this is a very meaningful structure is Chen's theorem. So Chen's theorem tells you that if I, if you look at the signature between S and U and multiply in this, in this sense with the signature between U and T, you actually get the signature between S and T. And this is actually not difficult to prove. Um, and it is basically a consequence of linearity of the, integ of the integral. So what you should think here, you see here is that this iterated integral is really an integral over some simplex. And a way to prove or the, the, the kind of obvious way to prove Chen's theorem is basically, uh, this is a, is, is a kind of uh, uh, representation of the big simplex from S to T by simplexes from S to U and U to T and some uh, uh, rectangles, which you need in addition. Okay, so Chen's theorem gives you really a, a, a good uh, uh, argument why this tensor algebra is a natural uh, uh, domain of the signature. And coming back to these words, it turns out that we can uh, also find a, 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 a dual structure to this tensor algebra. And this dual structure is also going to be an algebra. It's the algebra of linear spans of words in our letters. And the duality pairing between WD and uh, the tensor algebra T of RD is simply the following. 
Um, so we consider L a linear combination of words and we test it against an element of the tensor algebra by taking the linear combinations of the coefficients of A corresponding to the word I1, IK in the basis of the tensor algebra. Okay, I mean, what this means is, of course, the pairing, the result of the pairing is the real number. And this real number is always, uh, always exists, is always finite because WD is a, you know, every element of WD is a finite linear combination of words. Okay. I'm saying this because an element of the tensor algebra is typically an infinite series. So, you know, this is something we have to keep in mind. And now WD, I actually also turn WD into an algebra. And uh, the product that I define on WD is the so-called shuffle product. It's called shuffle product because if you play cards and you uh, um, shuffle them, you mix them in this kind of way, uh, this is actually what you're doing. So what is the shuffle product? It's defined recursively in terms of words and letters. But what really happens is, and you see this in the example, so basically, uh, so you have the shuffle product of the two words one, two, and three, four is obtained by all the permutations of the word one, two, three, four, such that one is always before two and three is always before four. So that the order in the constituent words one, two, and three, four is always preserved. So that's the shuffle product. And what had the shuffle product have to do with signatures? Well, that's the shuffle identity. So I have my two elements, L1 and L2, from this uh, uh, dual algebra. I apply the pairing for both of them and I multiply these real numbers. What I get back is the result of the pairing of the shuffle product of L1 and L2 with the signature. And this has certain consequences. Uh, the first one, I mean, this is not really a consequence, but uh, you see that uh, in this big tensor algebra, there is a certain group. And the group is all the elements for which this shuffle identity holds for all L1s and L2s. So this is now a definition. And this is in fact a group. And the first consequence of the shuffle identity for signatures is that the signature is always an element of this group. So what, what, what this means is that, you know, the shuffle identity doesn't hold for arbitrary elements of the tensor algebra. There is simply no reason for it. It holds for signatures, okay? And it holds for elements of the group. The second consequence, and this is striking for numerical analysis purposes, is assume you're giving a, pro a polynomial R, and now I'm talking about the polynomial in the sense of a normal polynomial. So it's a function lambda zero plus lambda one times x plus dot 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 lambda m stack x to the n. And I'm giving a element L of WD. Then if I apply the polynomial to the pairing L applied to the signature, I can find an element of WT, P shuffle of L, such that this polynomial is a linear functional of the signature and it's, it's the pairing between P shuffle L and the signature. And you can write it down in closed form what, the, what this P shuffle L means. So in other words, polynomials of the signature are actually linear functionals of the signature. This is something that is quite remarkable. So I say it again, just to, to emphasize, if I take a polynomial of the signature, and this is generally speaking, you think of polynomials as highly nonlinear functionals, but the signature is rich enough that every polynomial is already a linear function, or put it differently, the set of linear functionals 
of the signature is already so rich that if I actually take polynomials on top of it, I do not get any more than what I already have. And what if you truncate? Um, well, if I truncate... Uh, because usually you're going to be more with finite sums, right? If you truncate, yes, that's the difference. Because, I mean, it's a difference if your basically it depends where you truncate, right? If I take a polynomial and I take a linear, I take an L and I truncate only after L shuffle N, then nothing changes. But if I truncate before that, which basically means that all these guys after the truncation basically become zero, then yes, I lose information. It's not going to be true. But even if you truncate, um, there is some nice relations that you can pick up still, because basically uh, you you kind of uh, 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 you kind of divide by an ideal, a sub -ide an ideal of the algebra, but. I think this goes beyond the, the, this talk. Thank you, nice. So, all right. Um, we will come back to this later. We will use this uh, quite a lot. So many of you, uh, or some of you have hopefully, uh, have, may have heard of the concept of rough paths. And even though rough paths that are not really important for this uh, talk. I want to mention it because we basically know now almost everything we need to define a rough path. So a rough path is now, okay. So what is a rough path? So first of all, we start by, by seeing that uh, the truncated signature is a function which maps the simplex to the truncated algebra. And for such a function, we can define the p-variation distance. And what this means is I basically uh, project uh, my, um, my, my signature element, my x, to each of these uh, rd to the tensor n uh, uh, constituent uh, spaces. And on this space, I uh, compute the corresponding uh, p variation distance or p variation norm. And um, what a rough path is, or the set of all p rough paths, p is greater than one, is the closure of the truncated signatures, which are truncated at the integer part of p of smooth paths under this p variation norm. That's a rough path. And this sounds like a very abstract definition, and it is, but let me give you an example. The example is a Brownian motion. So uh, I start with a Brownian motion, a d-dimensional Brownian motion, and the first thing I need to do is I need to define such a blackboard bold W map. So how do I define it? Well, it has two levels. So I'm going to pick P between two and three, which means I, I, I will trunk it at level two. So the first level is simply the increment of the Brownian motion. And the second level is the iterated integral where I use the Stratonovich integration to define this. This is of course only well-defined almost surely. It's not well-defined for every single path, but almost surely. And the random variable that I get this way, or the process that I get this way, I call blackboard bold W. And it turns out that blackboard bold W is almost surely in the set of rough paths, of geometric P rough paths for any P between two and three. This is important because given a rough path, we can construct the signature in a unique pathwise and continuous way. And actually we can do much more because given the rough path, we can solve differential equations driven by the rough path in a unique pathwise and continuous way. 
I emphasize this because you may say, well, we know Stratinovich integration or ETA integration, so we can solve stochastic differential equations. That's true, but all these solutions are always just L2 solutions. However, if you are giving me such a lift of Brownian motion to a rough path, given this lift, and there is a almost sure thing going on in order to get to this lift, given this lift, I can now solve STEs in a pathwise way. So I have one universal L2, one universal null set. And apart from that, everything else is now really deterministic and even continuous. Okay, so that was about a uh, rough path. So back to our problem. So why is this useful for uh, the numerical analysis of non-Markovian infinite dimensional problems? And this goes back again to the shuffle identity. So say I have a continuous functional of now my rough path or more generally of a path. Um, now what the shuffle identity gives you is that this can be approximated arbitrarily well by, by linear functionals of the signature. Why is that so? Well, the first thing you keep in mind is the stone weierstrass theorem. And the stone weierstrass theorem, I mean, let's go back here. When you take polynomials of, this, of the signatures, this is obviously a, a, an algebra. So it's also point separating. And, uh, yeah, it's also point separating. So uh, we have the conditions of the stone weierstrass theorem uh, are satisfied. And therefore, um, this is, uh, the, the, the linear functions on the signature are, uh, first of all, dense in the continuous functions of the signature once you restrict yourself to a compact subset. Okay, so that's the first ingredient to uh, this remark. The second ingredient is that, and I am sl being sloppy here a little bit, that a rough path X is uniquely determined by its signature. So actually the signature is reparameterization invariant. So if you reparameterize time, the signature will not change. So in order to remove this uh, invariance, we add time as an additional component to our process. Now we can always undo any reparameterization because we know the first component of this new process. And therefore, uh, the rough path, in particular the path itself, restricted to the simplex, is uniquely determined by its signature between zero and T. And the combination of the two things, so, so this is saying that taking continuous functionals of the path is the same as taking continuous functionals of the, of the signature. And stone weierstrass gives you that continuous functions of the signature can be approximated arbitrarily well by linear functions of the signature. So I'm aware that from a, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do the math, there are some caveats here, but this is the general story. Now, coming back to the optimal stopping problem. First, I want to, to have a guiding example and the guiding example is a kind of weird example. It's an interesting example. It's the example of optimal stopping fraction of one motion. Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't really know if there's, I mean, I don't know any ap applications in real life of stopping fractional ground motion, but I think it's a super interesting problem from, I mean, super interesting theoretical problem. And actually, Beric Becker, Caradito, and Jensen, they consider this problem as well as a problem for their method. And what they're doing is uh, they, they do a very, I would say, a very simple approach because they're embedded into a Markov process by just discretizing first and then basically, so you discretize and you have J times 
time steps. And now you can trivially uh, understand your non-Markovian process as a J-dimensional Markov process by simply keeping the whole past of the process in the state variable, right? Now, and then they use a deep neural network to parameterize the stopping decisions. So basically, FJ of XJ is a neural network and its meaning is somehow um, skipping the exact formulation, stop at time J unless you have already stopped earlier. Of course, the, the downside of this method is that if for some reason you need a very fine time discretization, this means your space uh, dimension uh, grows very quickly. And what to get is a picture like this. So this is the value of the optimal stopping problem as a function of the uh, first parameter h. And I realize I'm really running out of time, but I, I want to, this is an interesting plot because at, when h is, zero point, is 0 0.5, then you have a Brownian motion, of course, the optimal stopping theorem says that the expected for any stopping time, the expected value of the stop Brownian motion is always zero since it's a martingale. So you get zero here and indeed, now, if h is bigger than one half, then this means that your increments are positively correlated. And that kind of is intuitively clear that you can take this into account to devise good stopping strategies. When h is smaller than one half, however, this means increments of the process are negatively correlated. And it is not at all clear to me how to, well, at least at first sight, it's not at all clear how you can take advantage of this negative correlation to devise good optimal stopping strategy. And I invite you to think about this uh, for the rest of my talk, which is going to be very short, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, if, you, if you can make sense of this. Okay. Christian, you, so, you can go 10 minutes over, over the hour, right? So it's okay. Uh, thank you. I will still try to, to, to speed up a bit. Um, so basically, what is our setting? We have this, uh, uh, we have actually talked about the setting. And what is the strategy? So first of all, and this is a strategy that goes back to a very nice paper by Carl Lyons and Perez Arribas, who consider a, uh, a, an, uh, a, a, um, an optimal execution problem in, in the financial sense, not in the, I don't know, <laughs> not in the punishment sense, fortunately. Uh, and basically the strategy that they uh, that formulate is the following. First of all, controls, in our case, the control is the stopping decision, is a continuous function of the path and hence of the signature. This is actually a pretty strong assumption, which is not usually satisfied for optimal controls at least. But still, if that is true, then we can approximate it by a linear functional. And the nice thing about the linear functional is if you now take an expectation, because we're solving a stochastic optimal control problem, then we can, of course, interchange the expectation with this linear functional. And that means I now have a completely deterministic problem, right? which is a function of the expected signature. Okay, and what they do in this paper is to basically try this out empirically. And our goal in our paper was to not only try it out for the optimal stopping problem, but also to do, to do some theory for this problem. And indeed, uh, uh, we define a, a, a signature stopping time now. So we, we, we specialize this to our problem. And a signature stopping time is a hitting time of a hyperplane in this infinite dimensional algebra. Okay. And that's something to keep in mind because a, hyper, a hitting time of a hyperplane seems awfully restrictive for a stopping decision. But note that, you know, 
polynomials are actually linear functionals. So hyperplanes in this, high, in this infinite dimensional space are an extremely rich set of sets actually already. Okay, and it turns out, and this is, I would say the main result or one main result of this paper is that under some very, very mild conditions, we can prove that taking the soup over all these hyperplanes and the signature stopping time gives us the optimal stopping, uh, the, the value of the optimal stopping problem. Um, interest or it should be said here that for the optimal stopping problem, we know that there is also an optimizer again under very mild conditions. So it's not, there is actually an optimal stopping time. And we don't know if this is also true on the left hand side. And actually, I would suspect it's not. So I wouldn't expect that there is also an optimal hyperplane. And I will basically skip the proof altogether. I mean, well, I will skip the proof except for mentioning one critical component of the proof is related to randomization. And this goes back to a paper that I had with Raoul and Søren Wolfers a few years ago. Um, so basically the problem is that Generally speaking, uh, stopping times are very discontinuous functions of the underlying path. And this is a, from this paper with Søren and, and Raoul, this is a, a visualization of this basically on the left hand side you have, I mean, I'm not going to say what is precisely, but you have kind of the raw optimal stopping problem as a simulation, as an optimization problem using simulated paths, whereas on the right-hand side, you get the pro optimization problem that corresponds to the uh, randomized case. And you see on the right-hand side, you have a very nice, smooth, regular function, whereas on the left-hand side, well, maybe it's still continuous, but not much more. And actually, it's not even continuous. Anyway, so continuity is, of course, key to this approach because if the function of the path is discontinuous there's really no reason why uh, a stone virus cross type argument should work so it is really crucial to randomize the stopping time in order to get continuity and actually you even get much more than continuity you actually get smoothness and all of this can be written down in closed form so here Z is just a positive random variable independent from everything else. Think of it as an exponential random variable. Okay. And F set is its, its distribution function. So this is one of the key uh, parts of the argument is really this randomization. And having obtained the theoretical uh, result, meaning that, uh, let's go back. What is the theoretical result that we have obtained? Taking this signature stopping times, linear, I mean, hitting times of a hyperplane actually gives you the optimal stopping value function of the optimal stopping time problem. In the last part, I want to show you how you can use this to approximate for numerical purposes, to numerical approximate the stopping problem for non markovian problem. Uh, processes. And there are really two approaches that uh, you can try. The first one is let's take the linearization property, the shuffle identity of the signature. Let's really use this. And at the end of the day, using the randomization, you end up with the optimization problem that you written here in this first displayed equation. So you have some functional, some very explicit function of the signature. Y is the reward process, which is supposed to be a function of the signature. And you need to uh, optimize over these linear functionals L. So that's what you need to do. And again, this is equal to the, the value that you get is equal to the optimal. 
So let's try to linearize the right hand side. And the first thing that you see is we have inside the exponential, we have this integral of the linear function squared. And the thing is, first, the linear function squared is, of course, the shuffle product of the linear functions. And then we apply an integral, but the signature is composed of iterative integrals. So this integral is actually also already contained in the signature. Therefore, what happens is we take the shuffle product of L with itself, and then we concatenate with one, with the symbol one, symbol one corresponding to the variable T. Okay. But now what about the exponential? And it turns out that you can actually approximate the exponential. You can represent the exponential of a linear functional of an exponential of the signature also as a linear function of the signature. And the way to do it is we define this shuff exponential shuffle. So it's just you take the Taylor series of the exponential function and you, you replace all powers by shuffle powers. And it turns out this is now a formal series. So it's not a linear functionals on the tensor algebra. Because now you have a formal series on the left and on the right if you try to apply the pairing. And there's really no reason why this should not should converge. However, what you can prove is if you apply this exponential shuffle to an element of the group, it has to a signature, then this actually does converge. And you can also uh, uh, pretty explicitly uh, bound the error when you truncate the signature at the final level. Therefore, and this is now the second main, main theorem, and let us concentrate on the lower part of the theorem where everything is a little bit simplified to, to, to really see what's going on. So let's look at this last displayed equation. What you see on the left hand side is again the value of the optimal stopping problem. Now what you see on the right hand side, if you ignore all these bunches of limits and limits, and you see we have now a linear functional of the expected signature. And this linear functional is the exponential shuffle applied to L shuffle L multiplied with one. And then we multiply this exponential shuffle with two. The two here being the dy, and we basically Assume here for simplicity that y equals to x. Okay. Um, and for this to really make sense, you when you take the sup, you you really have to restrict yourself to a compact set of linear functionals because otherwise everything just explodes. So you you restrict to this uh, compact set and then you pass to the limit and you also pass to the limit in the truncation level n. And there is a technical reason why we also need to uh, uh, restrict ourselves to a compact set in the space of graph paths. So, however, let me let me uh, uh, let me uh, really uh, uh, make the point that now we have a function of the expected signature. So there is nothing stochastic anymore. Problem is, this doesn't really work numerically. And it doesn't really work because this shuffle exponential lives in a very high degree. I mean, it basically blows up the degree of the, of the, of the L that you plug in. And therefore, you have to, you basically need to truncate the signature at a very, very high level otherwise the errors are huge and this is computationally way too expensive i mean there are some very nice uh, funny direct observations that you can make so for instance you can immediately prove the optional sampling theorem with this but uh, numerically unfortunately it doesn't really work because it's too expensive computationally. so what does work is however to uh, come back and this really goes back to the remark uh, 
uh, that for the question that Raul asked before about polynomials of the truncated signature. Because what we do is effectively that. We use linear functionals of the truncated signature and actually of the log of the truncated signature, of the tensor log of the truncated signature, which can reduce the dimension considerably. But instead of polynomials, you know, because we, we do the fancy thing, we use deep networks. Um, okay. And then you can also uh, uh, prove, and it's not very difficult, you can prove a universal approximation theorem telling you that this class of approximate stopping times, where you just, you know, instead of uh, uh, hitting times of linear functionals of the of, of hyperplanes of the signature, you use uh, these nonlinear functionals of the log signature. Um, and this works, this also, allows you to approximate the value function of the optimal stopping problem. And now let us go back to our example of approximating the fraction of running motion. So in red, you see the result of Becker, Keredito, and Jensen. In blue, you see the result where you truncate the uh, log signature at level three, n equals three, and just to remind you the dimension of the state space of the space of, of this G less or equal three is five. So you have a five dimensional state space, Becker, Keradito, Jensen have a 100 dimensional state space. And then we apply a neural network and they also apply a neural network, okay? And you see that interestingly, the line that we get the blue line here based on 100 time steps and these 100 time steps are used to compute this log signature to compute the iterated integrals. Okay. It's basically the same result. But uh, we then uh, just use more and more time steps to compute the signature. So, this is again, this is a, a discretization of this iterated integrals. And we can go to a level 10,000 time steps, and you see that the results are very different. And this is an optimal, this is a lower bound for an optimal stopping problem. So higher results, larger values means the result is better. Okay. And you see that uh, actually uh, provided that you saw that you compute your five dimensional iterated integrals accurately enough. And this is a challenge, especially when H is very small, you can get much better results using the same five features, five log signature terms. And question, course, question, yes. question. Is this really related to the deep neural network? No, right? No. You can do other stuff and you will still do fine. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is five dimensional. Yeah. Okay. And let me just highlight, of course, if you do the, the Becker, Keredit and Jensen, approach and you use 10,000 time steps, now your state space is 10,000 dimensional. Ours is still five dimensional, so, you know. Oh, this is huge, I mean, this is the step. Yeah. And what you can also do is you can visualize the stopping rule that you get. And this is my last uh, slide here. What you see here in, in blue is the running time. In orange is the trajectory of our fractional binary motion, H is 0 0.1, so this is a very rough process. In green, you see one of the elements of the log signature. So both of the blue and the orange and the green, all, of, all three of them are elements of the log signature, and there are two additional terms. And you see it's kind of somewhere in between, in, in, in roughness. There's this area between the two. Um, and in red, you see the stopping decision. So remember what, what, what I mean, the red one uses, so the red one uses the axis, which is on the right of the, of the, uh, of the, of the plot. And what this means is you stop the first time that the red curve crosses an exponential random variable. This is your randomized stopping. Uh, uh, decision. Okay. And you see, at first, 
this stopping intensity, if you like, stays constant at zero. And then around time 0 0.4, when you reach this, this, this uh, uh, spike here, you start increasing. It picks up, okay, something is happening. Maybe I should stop here. If you haven't stopped, then it stays constant for a while until you have the second spike. Then it really increases a lot to 200, basically. So, you know, you're an exponential function. The probability that your exponential random variable is bigger than 200 is very small, I guess. But you could still decide not to stop until then. And then it continues. It increases again when you reach this smaller spike. Now, this spike is smaller than the previous one. So if you stop here, you, you know, you did a, you know, at hindsight, you did a bad decision. But of course, now your, your, your time is starting to run out, right? I mean, you only have to till time one. So kind of makes sense. Okay. So, so just, a, just a question. Uh, in terms of this, this, uh, this representation that you had before, where everything was a function of the expected value of the signature. Mm -hmm. How do we make sense of that with respect to visualizations, right? Where is that expectation coming into the decision rule? I mean, is there a way to, to understand this? That's a good question. I mean, I mean, you should think of the expected signature. The expected signature. That's of course not true for the for the for the uh, log, uh, for the truncated expected signature. But the full expected signature under some conditions actually determines the law of the process. So you should think of the expected signature as something like a moment generating function. So uh, you have the, uh, when you have the expected signature, you actually have a function which depends on the law of the process. And that means, you know, you actually really solve the, I mean, a function of the law of the process can of course determine the value for the optimal stopping problem. Sure, sure. So there's no insight uh, there because I mean, it's already depending on the law, so. Yes. I mean, there is no extra intuition in that sense. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. It's a very good question. Okay. So you, you were wrapping up and I inter in, interrupted you. Is there any oh, no, question? No, I, I just wanted to say thank you for your attention. Oh, it was great. <laughs>